Amen. Amen. I thank the Lord for great shakings in life uh, to help us shake out of the places that we get used to, whether whether places that we love or things that we don't love. I just thank God that we can be shaken out. And I just thank God for letting me know that there's a spark worth fighting for in my heart, in this church, that I do th see things getting um, sharper. I do see that, definitely. And I'm grateful, amen, for the, for, this, for the definiteness happening in this place. And it's something that's going to be a fought for, something that's taken a lot of years to wrestle with. And you can see something happen. It's really, really precious. And the Lord is really quick to, to notify me of things that He doesn't want me to think about. You know, a thought, word, and deed has got to be sharp. And if it's uh, the closer to revival you get, the closer the closer the space is between His notifying. You know, we want to get so near the heart of the Father that when anything starts to think just a little off, some you hear something funny, something seems a little off. And instantly you know that is not the real deal. That is not the genuine article. And uh, we want that place to be a um, place that people know that this is a, a heavenly-minded church, heavenly-minded individuals that uh, will not budge on these things. And when we are not feeling comfortable in that place, and our, our comfort is not in the comforter, um, something needs to be readjusted. We've got to get back on our faces before God Almighty. So today I want to look at the scripture, a portrait in Acts 6. Um, I'm going to go through it. Um, it's not a lot, a lot of passage, but it's enough. It'll take a second to get through. And uh, then I'll go into the thoughts about um, a lot of what minds will overall stand upon and, and assume is 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 it um, thinking about where where is it that uh, the, the things that we know where does it where does what we know come from really and what do we honestly place our eternal uh, souls trust in what are we trusting for our eternal souls truly very interesting thoughts if this quote I heard from a kind of a somewhat liberal kind of in-between church, mainstream type of a church, saying that most of what Christians know is not from what they've read in the Bible directly. It is, in fact, from what they've heard. And that means that if we understand that there's so many different perspectives of the Bible, then what people are hearing is from a lot of different sources. It's not just from one person who has beheld the glory of Jesus Christ and having perspective that actually counts, but it could be one of the many that has never touched the hem of the garment, have never been, has never really been touched and transformed by God and continues to be transformed on that exact same level. If it was kingdom to begin with, praise God if it was, but it needs to remain kingdom. There needs to be a continuous uh, sacrifice. There needs to be a continuous burning. The oil needs to continue burning as it does in the temple in heaven, in the temple that was on earth. And that the temples of God's presence today, all these things must be continuous even today. So we're going to go ahead and we can pray and then we'll look at the text here in Acts chapter 6 and um, mix them together and see exactly where I'm going with it and then some of the thoughts that uh, did come this week. But let's just pray that the Lord of the harvest will be the one to instigate this message and this night for his own glory in his name. Father, it is your house, God. It is, it is your time. It is your hour for your word, Lord, to be laid out the way you want it to be, God. I pray that, that I wouldn't be the one really speaking, Lord God. I can, I can just be an instrument, Father, for when you really lay a kingdom message down, Father, to reestablish the grounding of your church, Lord, for how bad we need it again, Lord. We need, we need a brand new kingdom establishing in this time, Lord, for your people who are desperate, Lord, to see thy kingdom come, God. To see thy name exalted to the place it was meant to be seen at, Lord, that there would not be any wavering in it. There wouldn't be any disagreements at all for how could anyone not see the brightness of your glory and the brightness of your coming. How could it not be seen, Lord, if it is seen for true? It would be so easy to end all arguments among your people and to put 
us all back into the place that we need to be. For the light that does shine, Lord, is just so bright, God. I pray that your kingdom light would shine like never before in this time, Lord. I pray that your hearts of your people would be ready to be broken and hear the kingdom of God once again, that your name might be glorified among those who are blood-bought saints of the New Testament church, Lord. Call the colored into your blessed purpose, Father. I pray that we would hear your message tonight, God. Speak a word that I could never speak, Lord. Every time I try, it always falls to the, it falls to the ground, God. But you are the only one that can make words give flight, God. You're the one who can make the, the scripture take flight, God, in a way that the old church used to know because they knew you on their knees, God. They knew you in brokenness where you promised to be their hope and their trust. So set this message apart for your glorious call and let your name be glorified in this time. In Jesus' blessed name, amen. It's in Acts chapter 6, verse 8, starting here. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Sicilia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit which he spake. It's pretty interesting. Then they suborned him, um, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For if we have heard him say, for we have heard him say this that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men and brethren, this is Stephen talking back to the council, Men and brethren and fathers, hearken. The glory, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham. And now he's going to go speak several, uh, maybe 40 different verses about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and even down to Joseph, and leading all the way up to where David and Solomon come on to the, to the, the position in the Old Testament, rushing through the Old Covenant for a, for a very specific purpose and to the end of his speech and, to the, um, and then of course at the end of his life we know but Solomon built him a house howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands as saith the prophet heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool what house will ye build me saith the Lord or what is the place of my rest hath not my hand made all these things Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have and have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on that right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. 
And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And just like we were talking about last week, how dangerous it was to be preaching at Pentecost. And here you see the proof of this, the whole thing, that they were willing to kill um, Stephen and stone him to death for their misunderstanding of what he was saying. He wasn't saying some of the stuff that he, they're, they're charging him with, and plus they didn't understand even the parts that they should have understood. But you see what happens to uh, this wonderful man of God, Stephen, full of faith and power. It says he did great m wonders and miracles among the people. And they were it was so powerful that even his enemies, it says that they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. There's something about even the enemies, they just can't seem to, like, they're just like so amazed by something that when, when a person is so full of God's glory, they just cannot seem to want to leave it alone. They just say, I, I want to get around it, even though I know it's against me. There's something about it that is so intriguing. And like Raven Hill says, the most attractive thing is the Spirit of God on this earth to anybody. There's something about that that is just so marvelous and so powerful. But you see him here, he's, he's able to be literally standing on earth. And yet, he says, be, being full of the Holy Ghost. I think that this being full of the Holy Ghost was much different than what we have experienced because it said he looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. He says it, he says it exactly as, as the scripture is showing here. He says it exactly. I've seen the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of God and he's actually standing on earth. You know, when Isaiah saw the throne, he was actually in the spirit, actually in heaven. He was actually in heaven. This guy's actually standing on earth, the kingdom of this world, and he's able to see the kingdom of God, and he's there as this connection piece there. There's a meeting place of the kingdoms together where people were getting the clear vision of the one who was exalted to the right hand of majesty. And this is the message that was not received, even by those who said, we are the ones worshiping that true God, and you're, you're preaching words that is against the true God. That's what they're saying. This is what the meeting place that we need to remember is. There's a few different messages tonight. I'll show you a couple. Part, partly of like how much we place our trust in, in what other people have told us um, rather, really, truly, rather than where God Himself, you know, if you was look at everything of what makes the church so strong, this man Stephen was, I'm sure he was a scriptural man, but he was full of the Holy Ghost. That's what made the difference. He could see it spiritually for what it really is. And, and it wasn't allowed in this kingdom of this world. They were not allowing it. It was such a big hindrance to them, and the way that they had seen everything, that they had to kill it off. That's how you know it was of the devil. They try to kill off the things that is not right, and they, they just want to wipe it out as though they're living in the Old Covenant. And they were, and sometimes people, we, we go into those places like that as too. But this is where the kingdoms meet. Um, you can think about where the kingdoms meet on this earth. This is what he actually saw. This is where we have got to be here, a place where we're not going to budge because of what we see. Not because we're trying to stick to different traditions. We're not trying to stick to different protocols that we've learned. And this guy over here told me this and this guy told me this. Men are fallible. Their opinions are fallible about the Bible. Um, there's many different people on there. You can ask people how to fix a car. They'll tell you different how to, how to set up a sound system. And they'll tell you different and how to do this, that, and the other build houses. I've, I've seen how many different uh, carpenters do things differently and in the supernatural. They all have a different idea because they're describing what they can see. But what they can see is not really full of the Holy Ghost to the degree that we see in Scripture. When have you seen someone testify about the, the throne of God in such a way that actually got them killed? They were willing to take that kind of stand. Now, there's a lot of people who talk spiritual talk, and a lot of that stuff is in what I would consider the charismatic circles. And in these circles, there's all kinds of spiritual things going on, but yet the sword of the Spirit simply is not getting into that place. They're preaching a very different message. So when I hear them talk and they emphasize what it really is all about, they're emphasizing things that I cannot stand because it's nothing to do with what the Lord actually shows 
showed me when I saw the Lord high and lifted up but personally. He came here to deal with things that I did not want to talk about. There, There is this portrait that we see, we'll get to it in a little bit, but like we see that in, in Jack Chick, he was looking at this this picture of a man who was dying and he's, he's he stands before the throne of God and he says, no, Lord, don't show that. Don't don't show that on the big screen of what I said right there. I don't, anything but that. Don't show me that. Don't show everybody that. I'm too ashamed. You know, and, and, and the reason why there's a lot of people who are going to have to face the everything that we've done in secret is going to be lifted up to the highest skies for all the world to see. Everybody's going to know exactly why you're not going to heaven. He's like, don't show that. That's just too embarrassing. And the reason why there's that going to happen at the throne is because that thing that we don't want anybody to know about has happened and we haven't dealt with it in a legitimate way. So the heavens can open up for us to say, Lord, I am being real with you. I'm not going to leave these things un uncovered. I'm going to uncover them all and say, Lord, look at all of this. This is this the beginning of that. It's just the tip of the iceberg, Lord. I'm a little bit more messy than that, Lord. I'm a little bit more criminal than that. I'm, I, I'm not measuring up, not even by a long shot. I don't even measure up the things I preach, Lord, let alone what you actually are when I can see you high and lifted up at the right hand of the Father, bringing a conviction that is just so utterly kingdom. A lot of people will misinterpret it because they don't really get it. But I tell you, the Holy Spirit moves. It's going to start cutting some hearts and they're going to start to realize you're not just looking at Bible. You're not just looking at letters that kill, but you're looking at the Spirit of the living God, full of the Holy Ghost, and seeing something that they can't see. Whenever the world wants to take over things like a storm, we're supposed to lift up a standard. That standard can never be legitimately lifted up unless there is somebody who's going to be meeting with God in a legitimate place, full of the Holy Ghost, able to see both kingdoms at the same time. Everybody always knows that we're supposed to be, brother, we have to be in this world, but we're not supposed to be of it. Everybody knows that, but they don't know what it looks like from, from Stephen's position. They don't, look, they don't know what it looks like from a costly place like that. That cost him his life. But it cost him his life before he got to cost his life uh, physically. But it cost him his life and his will in order to be full of the life of the kingdom of God. He had to lose a lot, a lot, a lot before that too. And everything that you saw, the people in the beginning of Acts was losing so much of the things of this world because they caught the vision. It was so powerful. And that's the only thing that's ever going to and, and get into us and give us conviction that's going to give us the right wording to share the gospel truly. This is what God actually did in my life. I'm not just sharing you a story, but I learned in the Bible. This is not just dead religion. It's a living Savior that is alive today, speaking to those who want to behold Him in His glory again. And if there's not somebody who is doing this right now, we're going to have a lot of people who are going to be available to just go by whatever's being said. There's a lot of people who are very, very serious about their faith in Jesus Christ. They got their doctrines pretty well laid out. They are serious about the blood. They're serious about the Bible. They're serious about the kingdom of God. They're serious about souls. They just don't know where to begin because they're looking for somebody who can see Jesus for who he really is. Because in, and until they can see someone who is full of the Holy Ghost into this magnitude, they're going to be forced to say, well, I'll find something else that's going to float my boat. I heard Jesus This made all the sense in the world. It caused me to feel a little excited, gave me a little bit of encouragement. Brother Robbie, this is, this is pretty good stuff. This is in Jesus. We've been doing it like this for a long time. I said, that's wonderful. But where's that man who's going to get on his knees long enough to start to get into that meeting place and realize in order to hold that vision, he's going to have to be like the temple where there's an endless burning of the oil. There's an endless burning of the sacrifice. There's an endless uh, burning of the incense continually. All, all three of these things was continuous. So, so the temple was always alive daily. And we don't want to be like the Antichrist who goes in the final temple and removes the daily sacrifice and then causes the abomination to desolation. We don't want that to happen in our own spirit and say, Lord, I'm not going to sacrifice my flesh anymore. There's a constant burning of the flesh. That's what the temple is all about. So we want to have our fleshly nature continually burning. That's what it means to walk in the Holy Spirit. Who you are and what you want, what you think without God's presence and majesty is not right. It needs to be continually burned out, constantly burning out. As it is in the temple in heaven, as the temple when it was lively on earth for the temples that we've seen and the temple that's going to come again, it's continue with burning sacrifice and it was the devil, the son of perdition, that's the one that stopped, stopped the daily sacrifice and says, no more. This is not going to be under God anymore. It's going to be under a whole other light now. We don't want to be the Antichrist, the son of perdition, and let the daily sacrifice of our flesh burning every day and continuous burning. It's a perpetual burning. If there's not a man of prayer on earth touching and seeing for real for what it really is and actually paying the humble price of this thing, 
and not saying, the Lord, I'm going to wait till I get to the throne to say, don't tell me what I did wrong. I'm going to face it today. And no one's going to be able to have the heavens open until His Word and His presence comes to you for real and you deal with things according to His steps that He leads you into personally and then the kingdom of God will be released legitimately. So the world will be powerful, like the people who says it's got to be powerful. It's got to be biblical. It'll be biblical. It'll be timely. People will, some people won't understand it because they're so lettery that they're going to say, that doesn't match my denomination. The kingdom of God's going to come and it's going to match a little bit of everybody's denomination, if not fully anybody's, because otherwise they'd already be doing it. It has to be continually burning. It has to be continuous going on. I know what it feels like back in the day when I was married to my own business and I, I had to... Um, Always, it was always on my mind. It was, it was something that was, it was like your baby. It has to be always on your mind. Uh, you have pets to, to watch over. They're always on your mind because they can never be left alone too much. And it's the same thing with our, our faith, our prayer closet and the intimacy with God, making sure that the kingdom fire doesn't ever go out. We got to remember what the original fire looks like, or the, the original oil looks like, so we don't end up the virgins that don't have the oil. And Jesus comes back and says, can I even find any faith? And we want to be saying, yes, Lord, there's faith right here. I heard your voice even today, even just a few moments ago. I, I heard your voice, and then I heard the trumpet, and I knew it's time to go home. I see a, a, a chop-off type of a mentality that the world has. I think the church needs to learn from the world um, how, how quick they are to say, I don't want anything to do with this. This is too much of the wrong department. I, I've been delivering... I've been a truck driver for many years, and I remember one place I went to, one of the stores I went to, the, the gentleman in the back room, I, don't, he was just, I just overheard him talking and saying, this is the product we're shipping back out of here. We're not going to carry this product with anymore because they, they support the Bush administration, and we're not going to have anything to do with them at all. We don't want anything in this store supporting the Bush administration, so this product that I, have, that I heard has connections to the Bush administration will no longer be in this store. That's how serious they were about the chop off. Could you imagine if some Christian who was just desperate to know they knew they knew the Lord and knew it was going to be a continuous burning for the rest of their life and, and the cutoffs that you started to see, you're like, whoa, God, I can see. Just thinking about some of the thing, my thought processes in my week is, is just making me really, really, it's throwing me off big time. Some of the thoughts that I have going on in my mind is just, is so, just so grieving to the new life that the Lord is putting into my life as I'm beholding Him anew. And now, and now I can think about these things, I gotta cut it off, and I don't, I don't want to offend anybody. My friends, the only thing we can ever worry about is not offending God. If the, if the burning is gonna happen legitimately, the, the world is ready to cut the, the, the truth off very quickly. Um, I'm not saying the Bush administration is all true, but I'm saying but the, the, the chop-off mentality. If something that grieves the heart of God and in the presence of God you know this something is not adding up and all of a sudden you chop it off because this can't be. If the world is quickly to do that to us, uh, there's been a lot of groups that I think are compromised. I got to be friends with them because I think it's fun to sometimes you put your differences aside, get something done, and then sometimes you continue hanging out and teaming up and you realize you're speaking two different languages. God in the prayer closet saying one thing and they're saying another thing. A lot of different people are like that around me. And eventually I'm just going to say, you know what, I can, I'm never going to get anything done having to stop gears all the time. I always have them to try to check and see if, it, if is what God's telling me. Is it okay with you and you and you? No. It's ne we're never going to get anything done like that. The power of God's never going to be there. We're never going to be able to have a testimony of this magnitude where the kingdom of God is so obviously there. Even the enemies want to gather around and say that they were, they were impressed with this. They were, they were, the wording that they were actually, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. There's something about when the spirit comes alive so much that they, they can't not speak it right because they're speaking from a now knowing. It's a now current of, I see the knowledge of the holy and how else can I talk but this? That's how I'm consumed about. I know when people get onto certain things, that's all they think about because they're consumed with sports or they're consumed with a relationship. They're consumed with their business and the success that they're having. They're consumed about it. Get around them. That's all they ooze out, all out of, their, out of their pores. It's just out of their atmosphere. It's all business. It's all focused business. Everything chopped off. And then there's people who are going to change the nations and give all the people who are the masses who are mostly not prayer people. Throughout the whole world history, most people, even those who meant to be for God, were not mighty in prayer. 
but they were serious about God, but they personally were not mighty in prayer, beholding the majesty of God. So in that, they're, re they're ready to listen to this guy, this guy, or this guy. Anything that seems to be moving, anything that seems to be taking flight. So it's not that the folks are not willing to go to the things of God. So it's not right for the men of prayer and prophets or people who are called to mighty things. It's not right for them to be saying they don't care. They do care. They're just waiting for someone to show them the real thing. They're just looking for the real deal. It's like when I was years ago, before I got right before I got saved, I was watching the award ceremony and I saw one girl get on the stage and she was singing really good and jamming out. And I was like, man, that girl's got some skills. And then the next lady got on there and she busted the roof off the place. And I was like, no, that is, that is music right there. I mean, it was just way over the top. And I'm saying that's kind of the same thing. The church is saying, we're so used to this, that, and the other, and they all make sense. And it seems to be taking flight and taking float, uh, floating, but they're, they, these are alternative floating devices. But they just don't remember because the majesty of God has been so far from them. They don't remember what it costs they, to, to be so uncivilized and to pray uh, in, in agony. God, we got to come back into your presence. Lord, we don't remember what we're doing anymore. It just doesn't seem to be taking any, any, any real measures, Lord, against all the wickedness of this nation that's going on that actually had some decency in our past before, Lord. And we're, we're losing even the little that we did have, God. And I'm here to say that if we do not have people who are leading the masses who really want to do it right in mighty throne room prayer where the kingdoms actually meet if we cannot find men who can see from that perspective they are not we're never going to have the conviction and the definiteness of the ready to chop off and the ready to lay hold of, of the things that we're going to need to ever turn this nation back around again it simply cannot happen it can't happen something that we're going to be married to on a very regular basis. This man of prayer and a man of God who wants to change the world, um, careful how you approach them because they're married already. Um, people say, well, they're married to Jesus. Yes, but there's, some, there's, a, there's, a, there's an element to being married to Jesus that we got to remember. He's, he's, he's married to, to, to consistency. He's married to constantness. He's married to perpetual devotion. He's married to undivided mind. I know it's not going to stay that way, so I'm going to make myself do that. I'm going to tell my soul, rejoice in the Lord. I command my soul to rejoice. I command my soul to be victorious today. I command myself to remember. I command myself to get around there and say, no, I'm not going to be distracted. I'm going to be like David and meditate upon the, the law of God day and night that I can remember exactly whom, I, whom it is that I praise until his glory starts to quicken me again. But now we have a mindset in the Christian circles where we'll, instead of looking at ourselves under the scope of the majesty of God, like we see in Scripture, we start to magnify ourselves because we're better than the worst. You know, it's like a man who's not really pushing that hard to be successful in his life, just kind of barely making it, and then looking at someone who, who's on the side of the road begging for money and comparing himself to that. Well, it's the same as the church. They'll, they'll compare themselves to the cults and say, well, hey, we're not, at least we're not the Mormons, at least we're not the, the dispensationalists, or at least we're not you know, ISIS or something like that. And it's like, why is a Christian who says they're a living church of a living God are going to compare themselves to sheer death? Why are we going to compare ourselves to, to that which is obviously wronger than wrong, walking in the darkness of this world? in utter deception and delusion and compare ourselves and now we're fine because we're not like the stuff that is obviously bad. At least we're not the trash. Say we're, we're, we're good. No, you're not good because you're better than the worst. You're, you're, you're good because you're right with the Lord and you're in His presence, not by uh, word only, but by word and power. The kingdom of God is not in word, it's in power. Hallelujah. The things that we are supposed to be doing is demonstrated with the power of the Holy Spirit and overcoming presence of God. It is very costly. It is very painful to be there. Satan is also very patient. That's something that we could also learn from Satan, how he waits for the dynamic in the spirit to be just right before he takes a man down. He will wait a long time to cause as much damage as he can to make irre irrevocable damage to somebody. He'll wait a long time. Let them fly, do, re do whatever they want, thinking they're going to never be knocked. Nothing could ever go wrong. He wants to develop that attitude inside of a man of God or the people of God, especially the people of mighty in prayer. He wants to develop that thing. Nothing can go wrong attitude. He's like, keep thinking that. Keep thinking that this. Keep thinking that this burning sacrifice. Keep thinking that this oil that never burns is going to continue on. Keep thinking that. 
child. Go ahead. You are, you are powerful in God. He'll get you so built up thinking nothing could ever go wrong and set you up for a big one and cause massive amount of damage to that man because, he, because he's very, the devil's very patient. Christians need to be patient just like that. They need to be cunning. They, we, need to be, we need to be wise about how, how we handle things in our own life, but also how we win souls. Um, be wise, otherwise who are wise are going to be soul winners. We want to be so wise in the things of God that our life will influence others for the kingdom of God. Other things we want to see happen in our life, praise God, I'm with you. I do too. There's a lot of times I'm just like, Lord, I just need to see some things happen in my life. And really, ultimately, when I get down to it, I don't really want some things to come in my life if they're not going to be an enhancement to what I'm already seeing of the things of God anyway. So why would I back down to that? we got to be patient like the devil is in order for him to take people down. We also want to be able to take people down off their high horse and down to where they can kneel before the cross themselves and actually receive that which is of the Lord and pay the genuine price. How are they going to know the genuine price? Because they're going to have a genuine timing with the Lord. We have to be ready to be sensitive to the timing of God and not to rush to through little procedures and what we think needs to happen. I'm, I, I miss that sometimes myself and things things that could have been better don't go better because I, I miss them on those notes which is which is not too great there's a place over um, and there's a four corners of um, in one place in America where four different corners of states meet is Colorado and New Mexico Utah and Arizona and there's a little space out there with a bunch of flags around there and um, there's a this big circle in the, in the middle and you can and there, there's a you know the cross piece and it shows you where they're all at and you can literally lay there and get into the middle of all the different places at the exact same time. And it's just, it just reminds me of like how cool that is to be like, wow, I'm in, I'm in four states right now all at the same time. And you are. And it's, and it's kind of like what you see when, when Stephen is standing there before the kingdom of God. He can see the kingdom at the same time while he's in earth and he's of the kingdom of God, literally, into a very, very extreme degree. And I believe that that is really the place that we have got to continue. We look back at this thing and it reminds us of how radical the devotion really was. Ready to be killed for this very thing. So it doesn't matter if we compare ourselves to that which is low, we want to compare ourselves to, the, to that which is very high. We want to continue to seek to hear His voice. Where the kingdoms meet here, people are going to be looking for the next best thing, which could be on track, it could be off track, it could be way off track, it could be logically right, and it could be logically, spiritually right. Which is, which is it going to be? The prayer meeting was to be solemn, like what you saw when... Um, the lectures of revival from a man who actually brought in revival himself is called Charles Finney. And he says that don't be late to the prayer meeting and when you come in, don't be saying, hi, I had a, I had a bad day. Don't talk about any of that stuff. The prayer meeting was supposed to be solemn. He says sometimes it's very difficult to start to pray until you get around someone who is already in the spirit of prayer and then everybody starts to pick up the spirit of prayer and then they can start to pray too. It happens to us where we sometimes we need a boost to hear someone else in that pocket of God. I need to be in your spirit again. Lord, I need something to change, Lord, for my, for my heart to resonate. Like, I know it can, God, and this simply is not it. And I cannot be convinced otherwise because I've already been touched so deeply already, dear Heavenly Father. And there's a cry of the heart of the people who really want to say, God, I'm not going to settle for anything other than what I know you actually are. What I see in Scripture, the transforming work that you actually bring, God, I will settle for this when I know I've touched this place and I'm going to press through and I won't come out of my closet until I know it is real in me. The kingdoms connect here. And then when a man sees this place, his convictions are exact. It's not just shocking for the sake of being shocking, or it's not just biblical for the sake of being biblical. It's the nowness of God. This is exactly what he says about this, that, and the other. And he always has a word for everything, just like Jesus did. He didn't say the same speech everywhere. He was a kingdom reality, the Holy Spirit without measure. And it was, it was being measured, so to speak, to everywhere he went and said, this is what the truth for you is, one-on-one, -on -one, or was it to a massive amount of people, or just the Sermon on the Mount as a, as a regular, understanding of the kingdom of God at this time. There is a place where the church will see the Lord high and lifted up and know they will not be backing down, seeing clearly how much it will take and how long it will take in order to have enough spiritual power to overthrow the pushback of the enemy, waiting to know who we are in the presence of God, brokenness and trusting his judgments. Amen. To keep the church afloat, where she can remain what we see in Scripture at her finer hours, 
Without a true atmosphere of prayer, we will follow the many things done in the arm of the flesh in Jesus' name. Uh, it's getting pathetic. The, the things that have been invited into church is unnameable in the pulpit. I won't even say it. I could tell you in another atmosphere if you wanted to know about how utterly evil the things that are going on in order to keep the churches afloat, in order to keep people going to churches. That's how weak the churches is. Just because people are going to church doesn't mean there's a big church. doesn't mean the church is really doing well. Just because people are going into a building they call a church, that is absolutely the most unbiblical thought you could ever do. How deceiving can, can things get? Where Where is the meeting with the two kingdoms? Where is that place? If we can't see that place, we don't see, period. Because that's what it's all about while we are in this world. And when we get to heaven, it might not matter then. But a man of prayer is a faithful man of God who ushers in the presence of God and knows how to handle the Bible in the proper way. The Bible is a word of prophecy and not given to private interpretation, the Bible says. We need God and His Word continually. So a man who is of the Word of God, of course, but there's a lot of people who've got the Bible, and I'm telling you, it's just, it's just a dead heart preaching a living Word, and that together it's just wrong. In the, in the Scriptures before, if, if something that is holy touches something that is unholy, they both become unholy. The only way something that is unholy can ever become holy again is if it dies and then is resurrected again. So it doesn't matter. A dead man preaching God's living word means nothing. His perspective of the thing will kill. It'll be a killing frost upon any fire that ever was around anyway, unless that fire can get away quick enough. It's that mentality. Of, there's a language of glory that happens when someone actually sees the truth for real. And that's what we are never going to give up on fighting for in this house. Amen. You faithful man of God who ushers in the presence of God and knows how to handle the Bible in the proper way. It's not to give it's in the hands of any old person. The scripture says that his word re doesn't return void unto him. That, but that just means one thing. When God is prophesying, he says, this is what's going to happen through the prophet. And if it's a real God, the real God through a real prophet, that thing is always going to come to pass just as so. That's what that scripture means. It doesn't mean that every time someone's preaching the Bible in some church or something, that it's not returning void. That's not true. I would say honestly that most, most of the time it's returning substantial void compared to what we need to see. A man who is faithful to God, full of the Holy Ghost, so powerful that he's going to be even attracted to the people who want to kill him. We need God and His Word continually to stay afloat. And if we fail here, we will be subject to other floating devices that are in Jesus' name, but not in the true atmosphere. The conviction uh, is severe but it is done always in the proper timing, in the way that God would have us to be sensitive in, in those certain places, okay? Conviction of God is extremely severe. Talking to you about things that you would say, not that, Lord! <laughs> For people who think they're mighty in the Lord, then you, go, you tell me in your history where the Lord touched something in your spirit, deeply working of the Holy Spirit, and you, he got to the place like that guy on the throne saying, no, don't say that, Lord. I don't want to talk about that one. That's just way too hard to deal with. People who deal with these things legitimately, you'll be more like Stephen and seeing the, the, the true section here. One of the many things that we hear creeping into the church because people want to believe that we're fine the way we are is to eliminate our, our responsibilities. Any kind of doctrine that allows you to see that there's no responsibilities, I would believe is absolutely wronger than wrong. And so far from a touch of God that it's just not worthy of discussion. But I'm going to discuss it anyway because I heard it go to an all-time low this last week. The dangers of the, the can't lose your stance with God. Saying that truly, no matter what you believe or no matter what after salvation, that you could ever truly lose your salvation. That's what that's actually saying. The literal interpretation of that is to say that no matter what, you cannot lose it. And I heard someone take it to a literal stance, and it was actually quite refreshing. You can be gay and still be saved. That's what they said. You can become a Satanist and still be saved. You can even deny Jesus and totally not even believe in God at all and still be saved because at one point you actually believed in Jesus at one point. That's what was said this, this past week. Because of the, this doctrine here, like we talked about it before, some people will say that I'm adding to Scripture by saying this, that, and the other. But I'm saying anytime you explain your positions, you're adding to what you just said I'm adding to. It's exactly the same thing, except for yours is, is leading to a place where you're never going to see the heavens open. This is the mentality of those who heard this under a false light. I do believe in eternal security. I believe stay with Jesus. Keep the fires burning, just like the temple was always supposed to be. And when it goes out, that's when the son of perdition comes in, the son of destruction comes in. 
What if one takes the mark or blaspheme the Holy Ghost, or their name is blotted out of the book, uh, they fill their cup of iniquity, or they depart from the way of righteous living? The Bible is so utterly clear, so utterly clear. Eternal security is only found in the perpetual life of Christ in us. That is eternal security. Jesus said, I am the life. You depart from me. I mean, the rich young ruler came and talked to him. He saved. He knew he was the truth. He bowed before him, ran to him humbly, asking, what do I have to do to inherit the kingdom of God? He told him, I have work for you to do. Works for you to do. Amen. There's a lot of different places the Bible talks about works. Um, you see in Scripture, uh, people are so afraid of the word works, but the Bible tells you faith without works is dead. And I've even heard that, that OSAS doctrine so strongly. They said, as long as you have, even, even dead faith can save you. That's what, that's, that's what this is doing right now. Popular voices and so-called fundamental circles are saying that even dead faith can save, or dead, dead, uh, dead faith can still save you. You have, your, your faith is dead because you are not working with God. My friend, if you see Jesus, you're going to know who you are in Christ and you're going to act like it. How you act like it while you walk with Jesus, that is the works of righteousness that is going to save your soul. It's not the works of the law. Nobody believes that. Nobody in this universe believes that the works of the law is going to save you. It won't. Mormons are not even going to... Mormons are horrible. Their doctrine is utterly wicked, but they are not dumb enough to believe that their works are going to save you. I know them, and I've heard them. They don't believe that. Catholics do not believe that either. Nobody believes that your works are going to save you. That no flesh shall be justified by the works of the law. That's a small teaching in the scripture, but there's a massive teaching that says get to work. Faith without works is dead. If your faith is dead, you're dead. Dead faith and dead works is something that Bible comes against very mightily. To the seven churches, the first thing that Jesus himself says to them, I know your works. It does matter. I'm judging you by your works. You're justified by works, not faith alone, says James. Be ye doers of the word, action, worker with the word, not hearers, only deceiving yourselves. That's also James. Brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, judge by what we did in the body, whether it be good or evil, to the, to the resurrection of life, which is the rapture, or the resurrection of damnation, which is also known as the lake of fire. You're judged by your works. How we live matters, and it must not be built in morality of alone, alone in not moral or good people, or our good is going to weigh out the bad. No one believes that, <laughs> unless you're just completely unworthy of speaking anyway. A tradition itself, oh, we're going to follow tradition. There's a lot of people who follow tradition who have never been to Calvary themselves. They have never heard the voice of God ever. That is not okay. New Testament is in the voice of Jesus Christ. The letter itself will kill you. Compared to the life that you find when Jesus is on his throne and the kingdoms are connected and you know you know that you see it for what it is and it pulverizes you because it's so much light that the darkness of your life is just not bearable anymore under that light. Works of the law itself, nobody believes that. How, how we live matters, but it must not be built on morality, it must not be built on traditions, it must not be built on the letter, and it must not be built upon the works of the law itself. None of those things alone can save you, but it will be part of the salvation eventually after you get to know God. The only time he ever brings the law again is when people start to get into disgusting things. So Jesus brings a part of the law and says, you guys are mishandling marriage, and to me it looks like adultery. The way you handle marriage is your attitude is so fiercely wicked that you guys are carrying it on. Now you got people who are religious and they say you can never be remarried. Can't you see Jesus? I'm like, can't you see the whole Bible? Can't you see how he actually operates? Can't you ever hear what he actually says to people who actually know him? Why are you going to keep redundantly saying the things that you said all of your life, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and yet you have never been to the cross of Calvary for yourself where God can point at something in your heart and say, that's what I want to talk to you about. This is salvation for you on the other side of that door. Not that, Lord. That's way too embarrassing. That's way too humbling, God. Everybody's going to know now how fake I've always been. He says, I'm trying to talk to you about that. That's where my kingdom is trying to talk. That's where Jesus is trying to talk. And if he can get you to open that door, then Jesus as is your salvation. Then you can say that Jesus is my way. He is my truth and he is my life. He is my resurrection. And until he can talk to you about those things deep, deep in your heart, maybe he's not. Not that, Lord. Anything but that. This is the man at the judgment seat, and he's the angel showing him as a teenager. Got the dirtiest joke ever. No, Lord, not that one. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Checking out the ladies. This is a massive one for everybody on this earth. There's a lot of women who struggle, a lot of men who struggle. 
Don't struggle. Burn it out. Chop it off. Gouge out the eye, so to speak. Not literally, but ch chop it off. Do whatever you got to do. People are going to think you're crazy. That's wonderful. They thought Stephen was crazy too because he saw the Lord high and lifted up at the right hand of the Father. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her, with her already in his heart. Review his life. Yes, Lord. Here it is. He's watching his life before the judgment. Well, this is what Zach Poonin says. I say it all the time in the streets, too, because I like the little one-liners that really bring things home. They really bring the instant conviction. Anything that's not dealt with on this earth will be dealt with at the throne. So one day we'll say, not that Lord, at the throne, or we can say, not that Lord, and then actually deal with it today. Anything that's not dealt with on this earth will be dealt with at the throne. Anybody who believes that and actually deals with it, which is going to be really, really hard. I talked to a guy who does a lot of building. He knows how to build houses or build different kinds of things. And he gets paid a lot of money, $80 an hour, because he's really, really good. And we both talked about like how building the main thing of the, of the, material, of the, of the structure is, is hard, but that's about 50% of the focus and effort and the, and the, and the intensity of, of the job. But when you start to deal with all the little things, all the, oh, I got to have that special piece, you got to order it, and you got to go way out of your way just to do half of the focus is the stuff that is barely even noticed at all. People who take it seriously do precision work. Their work when they get done looks incredibly sharp and amazing. Really, really good. People who have that kind of attitude when it comes to the not that one Lord attitude and you're standing before the throne and they want to deal with the things before they stand there and say, Lord, I don't want to talk about this anymore. We want this to be dealt with. People say, well, it's under the blood. It's like, well, things that you're not going to deal with, I don't know. I don't think so. It doesn't sound like that when you read scripture. If you find a verse and verse here and verse here, of course, the Baptists love to bump around. The fundamentals love to do the hopscotch thing. They, they, they jump lily pads like the, like the Jehovah's Witnesses do. It's utterly ridiculous how people cannot just read the Bible and find out what God Almighty has to say for himself. Don't take anybody else's word. Don't put your eternal soul in the mouth and opinion of a man. If that man has not led you to the presence of God, he's not going to lead you to the presence of God. Amen. It's not where we came from. It's not the rock that we've been hewn from. Many of us will have to face this place of the not that one, Lord, in order to see the kingdom of God while we are still on earth. If you yourself want to see the kingdom's meeting for yourself and have a prayer closet that is not just, that's just bowing for no reason, we're going to eventually find a place where the Lord's going to touch on these things, for we can acknowledge these things. In earth as it is in heaven, when there's a real revelatory word, you will see, you will feel the embrace of eternity and know things that you could not have known otherwise. And when the kingdoms are connecting in the spiritual light, then you see the place today that we need to take action in, to be doers of the word and not deceive ourselves in order to maintain our walk with God. If you ever get to a place where you can't handle it or are not ready to deal with it, then you must stop and stare rather than move in a false way. Stalling may, you may recover from, but false ways are nearly impossible to navigate out unless it is a miracle of the wisdom from God's divine light guiding you back through the murky waters of compromise. But the truth of the matter is, if you will not with the first move, you're, likely, you're more likely not with the second because it's going to be a lot harder to deal with more later on than for the first one that we try to ignore. A lot of times it would take a very, very serious smacking into the wall, major personal crisis, extreme chastisement, or knowing that you are in checkmate. Three different things that really you've just come to the end of yourself and you're like, I'm flattened. Everything I've ever held myself to, everything I've been confident about, is all I've come to the end of. Everything I've ever thought was real and now I know I'm busted. And you're like, okay, I surrender God, whatever you want. You want me to deal with things deep in my heart, things from my past, my present, my future? I'll stop believing the modern preachers who tell me that my past, present, and everything's, everything's all fine and dandy, and, and stop right there as if, as if that's the last of the Bible. God, I, I don't want to hear from man anymore. I need to hear from heaven. I need to hear from heaven. I need to be able to have a prayer closet that looks like Stephen full of the Holy Ghost and seeing where the kingdoms are connecting and knowing not just that I'm standing on this earth and not, not just hearing these catchphrases that we're in this world but we're not of it, Lord. Stephen knew it, Lord. Stephen actually knew it, church. 
in a way that we don't, that we, that we haven't seen enough. And this must be the influence of our mind. This must be the influence of our convictions. Not to be legalistic. Some people think that certain churches are legalistic. Maybe they've become that way. I don't know. Maybe they've turned into tradition. I think that happens to a lot of places. But who's going to be the one dedicated to the prayer place to listen to the God on, on his channel? We'll be there soon enough. We will know when he wants to cut these things out of our hearts once and for all and let us know what it's going to be like when we actually stand before this throne that the scripture is uh, utterly clear about. Amen. Father, in your heart and hands, Lord, we give our lives to you anew, God, knowing that it, it's never been for us anyway. It was always for you. We were made for you, Lord. We were made for your glory, Lord, and we haven't been living for your glory, even with the things that we have known, God even knowing the issues of this world, even knowing the issues of the churches, God, and yet we have not walked with you as near your heart as we could, Heavenly Father, leaving doors open that we don't even remember how to shut, God, letting Satan try to knock on our door and, and actually answering the door sometimes and wondering, like, when are we ever going to get this thing right, God? We, we know that we need a move of God. We know that we need the kingdom of God to come. We need to see the places where they actually do connect. So we can come for real before you and actually know we know. Again, like the old church could say, that you know that you know that you know. Because in every part of you and everything that you are made of, parts that you didn't even know existed, all of a sudden start to know that they know the knowledge of He who is holy. God Almighty, bring a conviction that came from the glory, came from heaven, Lord God, not just to be sweet and, and, and nice, Lord God, but to, to floor us where we cry out for mercy and wail like the old churches did before revivals ever came, Lord God. They were willing to sound crazy because they knew they were desperate for something real, and they didn't want to stop when they knew it wasn't really you. Something else was floating and it had your name on it, Lord God, but we knew it wasn't you, God, because we have been touched enough to know better than that. We've seen enough word in order, Lord, not the hopscotch version of it, Lord, to know better than that. We're not going to fall for that stuff anymore. God Almighty, bring a conviction over your church again like it was when they feared your name and they worshipped you in spirit and in truth, God. And set your people apart from this world, Lord God. Not in it so much that we forgot who we are, Lord. We're church people who really care about the truth. And they can say honestly that I forgot where truth is. And then you see the things that they've stumbled into and, what, and, and there's no wonder why. That your blessing cannot rest there the way it ought to. But Heavenly Father, I pray that we would be shining examples, God. Burning, shining lamps. Continuous burning of the flesh. Continual burning of the oil. Continual burning of the incense. And the genuine worship that goes up to your throne. Hallelujah. So take your honor in our hearts, Lord God. May we be like that temple that is in heaven, Lord God. May we be like this one and not play the Antichrist role and remove the daily sacrifice, Lord. Let it be a burning reality, Lord God. Let us set apart, no matter what it costs, Lord God, no matter how much the world understands it or Christians understand it, Lord, it's not about them, Lord. It never was about them. It was about meeting with you that kingdoms may connect and that we may see thy kingdom come, Lord. Take honor in your life, our lives, God. Take honor in thy temple that we may acquire of you and the beauty of holiness, God, all over again. And let it be done in your son's blessed name. In Jesus' name, amen. same manner also he took the cup with and he uh let's see you start before here for i received of the lord that which also i delivered unto you that the lord jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he break it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Father, we just come before you at the table of the Lord. Father, I, uh, I pray, Lord, that this would be a time of remembrance of the inconceivable transaction that happened, the legal transaction that had to happen for salvation to be real for the world once and for all. And, Father, we, we thank you for that blood, Lord, as we remember the preaching of Paul, Christ crucified, and we also know the resurrection, Father, but we remember uh, exclusively and specifically the blood that was shed, Lord, that, um, that we know is the new covenant, Lord, in blood. And, Lord, we do this today in remembrance, Father, of you and what you have uh, laid out as a plan of salvation, the death, burial, and resurrection of your dear Son and our wonderful Savior, and the keeping power of the Holy Spirit. May it, may it all be upon us, Father. I pray that uh, today, as we approach the table of the Lord, that every heart would be uh, deepened in, in your kingdom, Father, in commitment, Lord. I know our attitudes are good. Lord, I pray that our spirits would be roused to see with the eyes of the kingdom uh, more and more every day. I pray that we would be lost in discipline to know that it won't we aren't going to just sail through easily that we're going to have to press through we're going to have to press through to be alone with you to slip away to be alone with you very very often that we can be like what paul says to be praying without ceasing lord i pray that we would be a people who are uh, utterly in the attitude of prayer father um to, that we may be uh, genuine and real to our finest moment in you father I pray that we would uh, be sharp and sober as we approach your your um, your table, dear Heavenly Father. Uh, bless this time, you the cup and the bread in Jesus' name. Amen. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true.
Jesus' name, amen. Amen.